Okay, everybody, we're just going to wait for another few minutes. See if there's anybody else wants to get in and then we'll, we'll get going. Thank you. right-wing government since the end of the Second World War, so that cannot be ignored. And her sentiments on patriotism, on uh, the defense Okay, I think maybe we should uh, think about making a start then. So uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome, uh, as always, to this month's UAS lecture. Um, before I introduce our speaker this evening and just go through the usual housekeeping uh, rules, please, I'm sure you're very familiar with them by now. Um, can I just uh, remind you that uh, the lecture is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. So if you have any problems um, with your tech this evening, you'll be able to catch up on, on YouTube. So please, uh, I think most people have their, their mics muted, but there's still one or two I see there don't. So could you please make sure your mics are muted for the duration of the lecture? And if there's any problem with your bandwidth or anything, um, it's best really to turn your, your videos off as well. Um, you want to ask any questions, uh, please type them into the chat box as, as you go along rather than submitting it on to the, to the very end. And I'm, I'm sure that Laura will be happy to answer any questions then. So uh, thanks always, as always to uh, Duncan for setting up a Zoom for us this evening and uh, dealing with any technical issues uh, which we hope we won't have this time, um, but who knows. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce uh, this evening's speaker to you. Um, she's Laura Patrick from Queen's University and uh, she completed her undergraduate degree in archaeology in ArtPal at Queen's um, from 2010 to 2014 and is currently undertaking a PhD entitled Cultural Landscapes of Medieval Vale of Ulster, looking at how the uh, landscapes of the late med medieval period were managed and how they were affected by political and socio-economic upheaval. And since 2019, she's been she was working in Carrick Burgess Museum, responsible for management and lots of front of house museum and delivery of audience engagement, um, public and private tours and uh, ed education, uh, workshops, um, exhibition development, grant sourcing, um, and so on, education um, management, so on, has been developing public material to the, on the experiences of uh, a woman and child in 18th, 19th century county of Antrim Jail in Carrick Fergus. And she's published paper in uh, the Ulster Journal of Archaeology, uh, volume 75, on the rediscovery of the 16th century tower house in Carrick Fergus, probably known best to you um, all as Dobbins in. So um, thanks, Laura. It's over to you now. Um, many thanks indeed. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. Hope that works. Can you see that okay? Yes, indeed. Thank you. And so thank you very much for having me to speak tonight on my PhD, which I'm so glad to get finished. Um, I buy them just before Christmas, so it was the best Christmas present ever. Nothing was going to compare to passing the Viva and I submitted corrections at June just before the summer. So I got to enjoy my first summer off in seven years, which was quite delightful. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk to you about some of the stuff I looked at as part of that PhD. Caveat, I suppose, it is that this is theories. So if you don't agree with them, that's fine. Um, it's just another way of looking at the landscape and trying to uncover what is hidden beneath. 
Second disclosure of the evening, I have a nine and a half week old puppy running about the floor. So if that starts to cause some havoc, I do apologize. <laughs> Hopefully he'll go back to sleep. So as Annie said, I am going to look at exploring Ulster's hidden medieval landscapes this evening. Works, yeah. So I'll just um, give you a bit of an introduction, a look at how our understanding of medieval Gaelic Ulster has developed over the last 100 years. What is a Gaelic society? Can we put a definition on that? How can we investigate the landscape? Can we use GIS, for example, mapping? Can we use this then to reveal managed landscapes and what are the possibilities for future research? So just a bit of an introduction. This is a quote which I've used from my, the beginning of my PhD application process right to the very end. It is difficult to think of another area of Ireland's past that's been so poorly served by scholarship. 2001, things have moved on since then, but not, not an inaccurate comment, maybe unfair to some of the work that has taken place over the last 100 years, but what has happened? So at the beginning of the 20th century, the political agenda of the new states really influenced how archaeology and historiographies began to develop. You had the likes of um, Orban and Oegby Neil arguing with each other about Gaelic versus Norman influence. And that became very, very politicised. Prehistoric, early medieval and Anglo-Norman periods received much more attention, primarily because you can see the, the archaeology above the ground. You don't have to go looking for it. We think of Cart Fergus Castle, Trim Castle, Newgrange, um, the Giant's Ring. The archaeology is there to see. And as human beings, we generally tend to investigate what is easier to see. As I said, the comment of Duffy is slightly unfair because there has been quite a bit of work done on Gaelic Ireland, but it's spread over such a disparate range of sources. You've looked at Gaelic poems, the annals and the state papers, but they're all in individual journals. There's no one coherent volume of work that looks at Gaelic histories and that brings it all together. There's no Society for Medieval Ireland as such, and we have obviously ITMAG, but that earlier period is, really isn't covered by a dedicated society. And other than surviving tower houses and church ruins, there's very few sites visible on the landscape from this period, and we'll look at that a bit later on. So how is the understanding developed then? So 19th century antiquarian researchers, it's very largely descriptive. So we have the work of, for example, Marshall Bagnell, um, the work of Shirley, who was documenting map resources. And this, this research is invaluable today because some of it was destroyed and the original sources were destroyed in the um, fires of Dublin during the, the political disruption. So they become a historical record in their own right, but they are very descriptive texts and they largely work of historical references of the period, which are incredibly biased depending on what side you're coming from. So they don't look at it with that kind of analytical eye that we tend to look at um, resources now. As we move into the early 20th century, as I mentioned, you've got the likes of Orkman, who wrote Ireland under the Normans, and Owen McNeil, very eminent historians of their period, very polarised, polar opposites in terms of the political scale, and they politicised those stories to make the argument for Gaelic or English control. The slightly more neutral stance, I suppose, was taken by Curtis whenever he wrote the history of medieval Ireland, and that volume could be seen as a complementary volume to go with, along with Ireland under the Normans by Orpin. And I think if Orpin had just maybe changed the title of his book slightly, he wouldn't have come under so much criticism. But again, we're relying on a lot of descriptive sources here. It's only really when we move into the mid 20th century and the later 20th century then, that the historiographies develop around Gaelic medieval Ireland. Focus is still on written sources, but the work of Nichols, Sims and Andrews is, was just groundbreaking for the time and they're still core texts that we use today. I reference them quite a lot. And um, then as we move through into the later 20th century, that's when the landscape really starts to come into its own and we begin to look at the landscape along with these historical narratives. So the work that McEarland did on the townlands, the work of Rhys Smith and Hammond on that wider medieval landscape. And it's only then whenever GIS comes into it and we can start mapping and getting the real 
easy visuals of these landscapes that we can start to really see what's happening and focus research. So the work of Duff, Duffy et al, work of Audrey Horning, Paul Logue, Porter and Lilly that flipped the Bodley maps, and Mackenzie and Murphy who have looked at the Ballyhanna site and really adopting that kind of GIS, the history, the oral histories, and that interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research that gives a really rounded approach to how we address medieval Gaelic Ulster because we don't have loads of written sources that are contemporary from those societies. So we need to adopt as many research avenues as we can. And that's also developed a renewed interest in medieval Gaelic cultures as well, because we can now look and get more information. It becomes easier to do that, well, easier to do that research. And the likes of Game of Thrones does help as well, because that kind of popular reinterest in medieval periods and it's been very much um, jumped on by our tourism teams here in Northern Ireland. And that has started to bring to light the light, likes of the tower houses as part of that tourist trail. And that's really helped ignite that public interest as well. So a Gaelic society, it's a difficult word when attempting to describe this discrete cultural group of people. Um, and very much one of the conversations that came up as part of my viva, what did I mean when I said Gaelic? I still don't know, um, not gonna lie. But for the purposes of my project, it was to describe those areas of Ulster that were moved from direct English control. And we'll leave it at that. <laughs> we can argue the point over a pint sometime, but in terms of this piece of research, that's what I mean. Predominantly rural in nature, pastoral economies, so it's cattle, pigs, you'd, um, seasonal gatherings at Tullahog, for example, in County Tyrone, and that's centred on dates like Beltane and Samhain. So it's this very seasonal exploitation of the landscape, <clears throat> excuse me, and bringing groups and culture, bringing society and communities together um, for seasonal periods. Political navigation of the English court was largely restricted to the kind of elites of society, the captains and the lords, the likes of the O'Neill. Quite clever in how they, they navigated that political minefield. They adopted English customs as it suited them. So for example, Shane O'Neill adopted some of the playing techniques that the English were using because it gave a greater yield and it was easier. Um, if people were coming to visit, he perhaps took them to the tower house, stone tower house, because that's what the English were used to, was stone castles. But whenever they were trying to reflect their own Irishness and their own Gaelicness, their otherness, then they reverted back to the Cranogs, the ring forts, and what they were used to. I think this is kind of it's shown best whenever the O'Neill has taken the knee um, to Sydney in submission and they're dressed in their Gaelic garb. They're recorded as going to um, Queen Elizabeth's court in their native dress. But yet there's other reports of them dressing as English when they're about London. So it's just playing up this sense of otherness when it sits them and then being submissive and obedient and applying their Englishness um, whenever it's politically astute to do so. So in all of this then, what I was really interested was how did they organise their landscapes? We have so much information on how English estates are organised. I know Duncan here has done a lot of work on ranges in England. Um, but how did they do it in Gaelic areas? We're just not 100% sure because the infrastructure in terms of the housing, field systems, it's not always there. Some cases it's really well preserved, but in Ulster, not so much because there's been so much farming and intensive farming that a lot of that system has been destroyed. So one of my key maps then was the Bodley maps. So following the Nine Years' War, 1603, the Crown is left with estates and land that it doesn't know what to do with. This is further enhanced in 1607 following the fight of the Earls, and they've even more land they don't know what to do with. So they do a um, just a written land survey in 1608. But the problem with this survey is that the relationships between townlands, between estates, 
boundaries are not explicitly stated. So they decided then to commission what became known as the Bodley Maps in 1609. There were a number of um, surveyors involved in the Bodley Maps. So we had Parsons, Raven and Bodley, but it's Bodley that they have been named after. And the survey itself takes place from the 29th of July in 1609 through to the 3rd of October. But even with our incredibly advanced systems today, I don't think we could do that kind of survey on foot for the entirety of Ulster, given the limited resources that they have. That must have been a horrendous task to undertake and to get it completed before winter, but they did it. And what's very surprising is the accuracy of these maps. So Andrews in 1975-ish did a study on the Bodley maps to figure out how accurate they were in terms of the townlands they represented their location on the modern landscape. And a total of 93% of the maps were more than 40% 40 accurate, which given the limitations in 1609, the threat of being attacked by Gaelic lords is really quite impressive and this percentage is further enhanced and um, supported by the work of Lillian Potter where they did GIS mapping to confirm the accuracy of the maps. So really really fantastic piece of work. The unfortunate thing is although they survive and you can see here for Fermanagh, Cavan, into Derry, London, Derry and Tyrone and Armagh, they don't survive for Antrim um, and the North East. So we can't use them to map the entirety of Ulster, but what does survive lets us map quite a bit. And they're an absolutely fantastic resource. And the reason they are so interesting and so useful is because the surveyors mapped right down to the individual townlands. They're not all the right shape and they're not necessarily all in the right position, but they're there. And within that, then they map the individual estates that were under lordships. So we have the estates and the townlands, which formed the main body of my research. And the two areas I looked at then were the Lichty of the O'Neill in Tyrone and South Armagh, the Fuse, which was um, an offshoot of the O'Neill. So just to zoom in a little bit, some of the townlands you can see here is Donalumptra which was one of the O'Donnelly estates. Dungannon is obviously the O'Neill's estates, but there's quite a few that don't indicate by their naming who had lordship over them. So there's another one you can't see, which is um, Devilantra and Devilantra, and that was the O'Devlins. But quite a few, excuse me, like Muntra Mill and Dochran, Ben Burb, there's no immediate association with a family with a sept, um, therefore it was difficult to identify. But not to be beaten, we very thankfully have this record from the Bodleian Library. And this is just a small excerpt from it, but it shows you here the McDonald's, who are the Galloglass, Scottish Galloglass of the O'Neill Lordship. And yes, they have their main country called Ballygolly but they also have Bally, and I do apologise for the pronunciation, Bally Ray, Clan Ennis, Clan Arty, um, and the same for the O'Donnellys, then they have their main estates, but they also have um, O'Corrigan, Montreux and Mail, um, and it just shows that while they may have their primary estate, they're also controlling these other estates. And that then allowed me to um, ratify who owned and who managed what. So in terms of how this fits in a hierarchy of society, so Emil is at the top and his four private estates are Bimberb, Dungannon, Care, Dungannon and Care O'Neillan. So it sits across two different barneys. The families that we are dealing with within the sept are the O'Devlins, the O'Donnellys, the O'Hagans, the O'Loughrins, the O'Quins, McDonnell, McShane O'Neill and McFelm O'Neill. So they all sit within the Lucti as part of the household and they all had a role to play within managing that landscape. 
and managing the lands for the O'Neill so he could get maximum profit. So for example, O'Donnelly was responsible, that was his marshal, so they were responsible for soldiers. O'Devlin were his true cairn, again, they were soldiering. Um, O'Quinn would have been more administrative, um, as was O'Hagan, and they were responsible as well for managing Tullahoke and the inauguration process. MacDonald, Gallaglass, that's defensive at soldiering, and McShane O'Neill and McPhelm O'Neill, they are branches of the O'Neill clan, the O'Neill sept, um, so they have that kinship association. So in order to use this information in a meaningful way and map it on the landscape, quite a process to be followed. So an ArcGIS, which is a geographical information system program, and it basically allows you to put in analog information and you can create a visual from that. And you can also incorporate maps that are in existence, for example, OS maps, you can put in aerial rasters and visuals. Um, so initially I set the coordination coordinate system to the Irish grid because I'm dealing with the first edition OS maps and that is the most accurate way to represent them and it reduces the amount of skewing in the data and the image. Um, once all the OS maps for the study area were added, then I overlaid them with an aerial raster. All of these were provided through Queen's from the Land and Property Services, very grateful for that. And that meant I could flick between the modern aerial view of the landscape and the historic OS maps. And I could change the transparency to see how the modern townlands overlapped with the historic townlands, where there had been amalgamations or divisions. Um, added to that is the townland information in terms of the entomology as well and the naming, which is incredibly useful. And each individual townland then had to be matched to what was on the Godley map. And I can assure you that took quite some time <laughs> um, to identify each one because a lot of the names would have been recorded by English authors, so it becomes anglicised. So whenever you're looking at the Gaelic meaning of that particular townland through the um, townland names survey, it doesn't exactly match up. So it is a little bit of the estimation and it's tracking through the different OS maps. It's looking at the Down Barney survey from the 18th or 1640s to just make sure that you have the exact uh, townland. There has been amalgamations and subdivisions, especially in the 1640s, whenever you have another influx of planters and there's quite a lot to become some divided um, into quarters. Um, but very, very satisfying process once we were able to ratify them all. And generally speaking, they were in the, the right location in terms of how they sat against each other, but the shapes were, shapes were completely off. Um, river systems are included in the Bodley maps, but they are not particularly accurate. You get the main rivers running through, but it's a general representation. They're not in the right place. So they're difficult to use as markers in the landscapes. And the same for the mountainous areas. They're in the, generally in the right place, but um, not exact enough to be useful. Um, and then added to that, I was able to add the modern topographical information, which is a DEM, a digital, a DTM, a digital terrain model, and the modern river system as well. And you'll see why shortly. So this is what I produced after all that work. And it looks quite simple now, but it took quite a lot of time. So I think there was 639 townlands within the O'Neill Lucky, and in the fuse there was just short of 60. Um, for each of those townlands, I had to try and match them up and ratify where possible. I haven't changed the shape of them to the Bodley maps in terms of where subdivisions and amalgamations have happened, but that is recorded in my appendices. So what becomes very interesting on this map to the left, which is the Lucti. So the pink here, S, T, J, F and C, that is all under the control of the O'Donnelly, which is the marshals, which is the soldiers. All the blue 
is under the Galaguas, again the soldiering. The Northwest is controlled by the McFlelm O'Neill, so that's a branch of the Clan Du Boy, and P and O are McShane O'Neill. So this entire flank of the estate is surrounded by kin and soldiering, which becomes very interesting whenever you start looking at it as a soft border because there are no hard borders. Brexit seems very appropriate here. There's no hard borders in these Gaelic estates. They just flow into one another. And without that definition on the Bodley maps, we wouldn't know where one started and one ended. But whenever we start mapping out where the estates sit in relation to O'Neill, G, right here in the middle, we can see that he is surrounded by his family and his soldiering sets. And that is defending him from the Maguires in the west and then the English to the southeast. When we go further north, so B and A are the Devlin. Again, that's protecting from the north west, the northeast, sorry. Um, but whenever we come further into D and E, that is the O'Quinn's estate split into two, and that is administration. And again, Y is set there at the top, protected on both sides by soldiers. Um, and that is again administrative, very close to O'Neill in the centre. So it meant they could get resources and information to him as quickly as possible. But what also becomes quite interesting is O'Neill's estates themselves are quite small. So this is G, H and I. And they nearly provide a route out through the estate into the barony of O'Neill land. And then down to the east and down to Dundalk and Dublin. So it's almost as if he thinks, right, if my captains and current you can turn against me, I have a way to get out through my estates, through the church land, and I can escape. Thankfully, that didn't happen, so he didn't need to use it. But also, he's surrounded himself mostly by church land, so he's, it's a buffer from his lords and his captains. So although there's no hard borders in Gaelic estates that we've uncovered yet, I mean, there could be some hidden under the landscapes, but the fact that they are using soft borders at this stage, very, very interesting. The O'Neill's are the fuse is slightly different because it's an isolated estate in South Armagh, so it doesn't have that same expanse of protection. So in terms of the townland analysis, I went through every single townland, so 639 plus the 60 in the fuse. And what you can see on the right here is the recording sheet that I produced as part of that. So I looked at the etymology, I looked at the Bodley map, I looked at the features recorded on the first editions of the OS map to, excuse me, remove any anomalies such as quarrying. Um, I looked at the sites and monuments records, so any rafts, um, ecclesiastical sites, settlement sites, all of that was recorded. One thing that became very interesting was the river system. Once I'd mapped the modern river system, and using the data from the Sites and Monuments database. And that takes you down to stream level nearly. So you could see a lot of these townlands were being surrounded by river systems and where river systems had possibly dried up, there were roads in, that, in place. I think that's one thing, a question that's always come up again and again is how were these townlands demarcated? With, I mean, there's no borders. and I think we can conclusive, well, not conclusively say, I don't want to put myself <laughs> risk um, questioning, but it's becoming more and more apparent um, through this and through other case studies. Um, for example, Siobhan McDermott um, looked at a, a state in Monaghan that it's the river systems that they're using to market the townland boundaries. And it makes sense. I mean, river systems move so slowly over time that there's the least amount of destruction. So they can clearly identify where one townland starts and the next one begins. Um, so that was quite, I was quite intrigued by that whenever I realised and I started going through each individual townland. Um, and I estimated 
what sort of percentages um, of demarcation there was for, for each townland. But when I started looking at the townlands individually as well, I ended up falling down a rabbit hole because I could start seeing patterns in the field systems and the field boundaries. I thought, oh, that's not on the sites of Monuments Record, but there's clearly something there. There's no reason for the site or for the field boundary to be in a perfect semicircle. There was nothing that it was going round or moving round. Um, and going back through the OS maps, there was nothing that had been cleared that had maybe gone round previously. So as I moved through each townland and each estate, then I started recording possible enclosures, which is what these appeared to be crop marks, um, it could be field boundaries, it could be roads that have gone round something that was there before. Um, and that started showing quite an interesting pattern then in the landscape. So each was marked and then an aerial image was taken of each on the record. So as you can imagine, quite a lot of work <laughs> went into this. Most of it happened during COVID um, when I was on lockdown and furlough. So, you know, silver linings. So this then, if we look to the wider um, landscape of Tyrone, um, and I'm conscious of time, this is what is recorded on the Sites and Monuments record as it is. So I was able to download that, put it into my GIS system, and I separated each of the sites out by date. So just to give you some statistics across Tyrone and the Fuse case studies, there were 18% prehistoric sites, 38 early Christian, 2% medieval, including the 14th century, 1% late medieval, including the 15th, 16th century, 5% post-medieval, including the 17th century, 6 modern, 1 industrial, and 29% uncertain. So if anybody from outside of Ulster, of, of Ireland, um, who wasn't familiar with our landscape or history, was looking at this percentage breakdown, they would think that the medieval landscape just didn't exist. There had you know, been a massive fall in population after their Christian period um, and what happened to all the people but we know from the annals that this didn't happen and this is what really intrigued me then where were they where are they in the landscape why can't we see them which becomes a little bit controversial <laughs> towards the end when I give you my explanation but again just a theory so as you can see here a lot of the sites, you know, the red is early Christian, so that's the vast majority of the sites. White dots are prehistoric, so you can see them dotted across most of the estates. One of the things which has really helped archaeology is development of road systems. We all know all the work that's happened down south and part of the Discovery series, and it's happening increasingly in the north. Dare I mention Drum Clay Cranog? But this is one of the main roads that goes through to Rome. And there appears to be a line of prehistoric occupation, which would sort of lead one to imagine that there is a reason for this line of occupation and you start creating a pattern. But the danger is it's an artificial pattern. It's been created because those sites have been stripped for road development and they have found additional sites that weren't there before and not visible on the landscape. It's only whenever you strip back the topsoil that you can see the ditches, the, uh, the post and hole marks, the charcoal burning. So just a word of warning, I suppose, that whenever we see patterns like this, it doesn't immediately mean anything in particular. It just means that they've done quite a bit of excavation here. They've cleared the landscape and there seems to be quite a lot of prehistoric activity happening. What we can take away from it, I suppose, is the fact this is a relatively small area. I mean, you're talking the maximum, I don't know, 100 metres in width of an area that's been excavated and they have found this real concentration of prehistoric sites. So it just kind of boasts the question of what else is out there that we can't see and we haven't developed the techniques, techniques to look at it in um, big landscape way yet. And as I said, whenever I was at the townlands, I kept finding these unusual marks, crop marks, field marks, boundary marks. 
I thought, well, what happens if we then plot those on the map? And while some of them may be completely random and completely unjustified for being on this map, all of a sudden we have a much more populated landscape, which would correlate with the fact that we didn't have mass population dips in the 15th and 16th centuries. Yes, with the Black Death and we had destruction and we had the Nine Years' War, but people were still living, they were still farming, there were still communities existing and being very rural in nature, they were dispersed across the countryside, they weren't concentrated in um, urban areas. And once we put these unknown and uncertain sites on, all of a sudden it becomes a much fuller landscape. Now you do get concentrations in areas where there's better land, for example, excuse me, towards Loch Ney, less sites when you get up into the sort of more mountainous and boggy areas, which makes sense. Um, it's the same today. So just what what could could be hidden underneath? Could be. I'm not saying it is. <laughs> Don't quote me. And again, if we look at the how the sites are described on the sites and monuments. So I looked specifically at enclosures because that's what kept coming up in the landscape was these additional enclosures. So I looked at the, um, the RAS, the possible RAS, the um, AP sites and mapped those. And whenever you add the possible enclosures that I'd identified again, it becomes a much more populated landscape. And it's the same for the fuse. Predominantly early Christian sites, but whenever you add the uncertain and the unknown, a much more populated landscape. And again, enclosures, rafts, it rains, whenever you add the additional possible enclosures, a much more populated landscape. My proposal, therefore, is that enclosures, rafts, ring forts, whatever we want to call them, are not just restricted in these areas to the early Christian. I think they are being used right the way through the medieval and into late medieval periods. Same with the Cranogs. These sites aren't just abandoned. Most theory, or many are now theorizing that yes, that's, that's fair enough, that's the case, but there hasn't been enough excavation to prove either way. So this is why this is just a theory. But it makes sense if there's wraths there to that extent in the landscape, why wouldn't you continue to use them? Why would you waste resources building new continuously whenever you don't have the kind of population to maintain that? What I'm looking at is this kind of idea of, especially in the Tyrone and Armagh cases, the drumlin is the center of activity. So if your enclosure at the top of the drumlin, your farmstead, and then your activity radiates down and out from that. Because across the fuse and in the main body of the fuse and through one, you don't get significant differences in terms of the, the height, the topography. Um, one of the theories was that some of the estates, like the O'Donnellys, was split in two to allow for bullying, a smaller estate being at a higher altitude away from summer pastures. But that's not the case whenever you look at it on the digital terrain models. The landscape is very, very similar. It's only whenever you get to the very west that you start to see the landscape really rise and become less, um, less valuable. So I'm not, we'll never know how much bullying went on, but in these landscapes, maybe not as much as we think. It's a bit like today, um, for anybody that lives in the countryside, the farmers, they move the cattle around the fields in stages to let the grass grow. And it may well be that this is what's happening within these drumlin landscapes. The cattle are moved around, the drumlins kept up from the pastures. Um, and that's how they're sustained. This cat, these cattle would have been a lot smaller than we have today. They would have been easier to manage. They didn't need as much grass. The big thing about Ireland is the fact that we can grow grass nearly all year round. So there was that sustainability piece as well. Again, it's just a theory. <laughs> Within these sites, then, you're probably looking at wattle and daub buildings, um, timber crock buildings. We see that on the Bartlett maps. Tar 
um, wooden tower houses. Again, not a new suggestion. Um, Donnelly and Logue looked at this um, previous as, previously as well, and you can see one depicted here from the campaign maps in the Nine, nine Years' War. But I suppose it just hasn't really been applied to the wider landscape in the same way before. So I think it's these wooden buildings, these wattle and daub structures that we just can't see on the modern landscape. And it would only be through excavation then, for example, um, the one that was excavated at Tullahog um, by Brian. That's the one they start to make themselves visible. So, so what is hidden beneath our landscape that we just can't see um, and we don't know, but it holds the answers to so much about Gaelic society. And this is just an example of what a labourer's hut might have looked like. This is recorded by Young in the 1800s. It's not going to leave much of a, lands or a mark on the landscape um, once that's decomposed and destroyed. There's not going to be much there, apart from perhaps a charcoal remnants from the hearth. So we sort of need to look then at how, how can we pick up these so ephemeral evidence, some, the, the evidence of something so ephemeral within the landscape. There has been studies that look at um, carbon deposits and minerals um, in the soil, but how can we use this and focus it into these possible enclosures to see if there is any, any evidence there without having to do a full excavation? Can we see higher deposits of carbon and charcoal? Um, is there evidence that an area might have been farmed intensely um, or manured? Perhaps. So in terms of then possibilities for future research, I'm in no way applying for postdocs at the minute because I'm so glad to get this finished, but there is work that I would like to take forward once I've had a bit of a break. So large scale townland surveys, I think, need to be done on a much wider base across the island. Um, Cotter has done some great work on um, the, the wider, the bigger estates, but how how can we do this on a townland level to really investigate the landscape and see those little quirky things, the, the field boundaries, the crop marks that are popping up? Can we start to use LIDAR on drones to make this more affordable and sustainable? Um, you know, we need a policy that lets us do this and a strategy. Um, there's so many sites that I came across that are definite crop marks that they're not on the sites of monuments records. So there's a piece of work there, you know, whether we do geophysical survey or it's field walking to try and ascertain whether these sites are viable. And that obviously then lets us think, right, okay, this is where we need to do targeted excavation because excavation is so expensive and destructive. You want to do it in a really holistic way that lets you get as much information without destroying as much of the information at the same time. Um, I think in some of the, the work that's been done on Roman sites and how much they can see just by using really intensive geophysical surveying. So this will allow us then to investigate the material culture and establish, is what I'm saying about the building types, is, is that accurate? Um, there has been great work done, but I think across my case study area, 7% of ring forts have been excavated and that's only the ones that are identified on the sites and monuments. So is that is the information that we have and that can that really be extrapolated when it's such a small percentage? You continue to challenge the, the use and the reuse of the ring fort and cranogs um, through the medieval and late medieval period. This has been looked at in the south as well, and start to readdress those narratives on a pan-island scale, not just individual case studies. Explore the extent of timber houses as elite residences. This is not unique to Ireland, it happens across Europe. Um, and also I didn't really talk about it tonight because it's a lot to cram in um, in such a short space of time, but the church, what effect did the church and the church lands have on how the, that landscape was managed? We know that some were absorbed into the lay estates. Um, there's the Ernach families and all, all that, so there's, there's a lot that there's a lot of possibilities still there in terms of future research, and I think I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you.
Laura, thank you very much indeed. I find uh, that uh, particularly interesting as a former cartographer myself, and um, I'm absolutely delighted to see how uh, GIS and, and mapping, you know, can be used in this way. And uh, you know, I always think this visual certainly makes it much easier to try and sort of understand um, land, how landscape was was used and developed. Yeah. Um, so I mean, you've you've made a, a great a great start on that, but as you say, you have so many more things that you you could do to develop this this further. So yeah. uh, very many thanks to you indeed for your, for your presentation, and uh, you yeah. in the future you maybe come back and tell us more as, as your, your research uh, continues. So um, how we look here to see, I think there's some questions are starting to pop up now. Um, oh, from, from Pat O'Neill, <laughs> better be careful what we say here. <laughs> um, is it a co coincidence that O'Neill's territories correspond with the areas designated as early Christian? I don't, I don't think, um... There's a coincidence as such. I think it's more the fact that rafts um, and enclosures as identified on the sites and monuments are recorded as early Christian. And that's what the vast majority of those early Christian sites are. Um, and you have a couple of churches in there as well, a couple of ecclesiastical sites. So I'm not sure if that's a satisfactory answer, but I think, I think it's more the the sites themselves as opposed to the areas, if that makes sense. Yeah, Laura, I was just looking at your at your maps and you showed the you know, O'Neill territory, O'Neill's territories, and you, you commented that they were quite small. And you showed the link between, you know, from Loch Ness region out to the east. Yeah. You talked about escape routes and all. And then later on when you showed the, the map of the you know the different sites and some were designated um, uh, early uh, Christian sites, and it almost it was almost identical to the distribution of the O'Neill territories you showed earlier, and thus was just raised a, an interest. Being an O'Neill myself, of course, was kind of interested in that. Yeah. I, th I think it is just that that dominance of rafts and being associated with early Christian. That's what comes comes through. But I think um, excavation would maybe explore that a wee bit more. Yeah, I was only I was only trying to jump to conclusions and, and speculate and maybe say that O'Neill's territories go back where they found it in the early Christian era. That I mean that's what it's really coming from. So that branch of the O'Neill moves down into Turon around of uh, the end of the tenth century, I think. Start of start of the eleventh century. Um, they were originally Donegal. So, yeah, there's so much to unpack that I couldn't even yeah. go through, you know, that kind of historical piece. But yes, they came down um, into Tullahoke and we have annals, uh, references in the annals of them coming, coming down. Now, whether they take over definitive sites or estates that were already in existence or whether they create their own estates, that we're not sure about. Um, and that's something that I was intrigued about, you know, did some of the previous families stay on under the O'Neill or are they all kicked out and the state's taken over? So that's, that's a question I still have that I would maybe like to answer someday. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. All right. Uh, several thanks coming in, Laura. Um, having not any more questions. I see a comment, comment on it. Just something that struck me when you were um, talking earlier about... Um, how the timeline boundaries were sort of defined, as it were, you know, at the time. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, when I worked in Northern Survey, um, I remember hearing about the beating of the bounds when the timeline boundaries were literally walked. Yeah. So that people would remember them, and somebody got a thrashing at each sort of boundary change point at the nearing points. That was thought. Help, help people remember where, where the boundaries actually were. Do you think that dates right back as far as this period? Or was that just a much later sort of innovation, trying to remember exactly where the boundaries were before they were actually uh, depicted accurately uh, you know, by the first Northern survey? 
I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I don't have an answer to that, but I suppose traditions have to start somewhere. So I could, I've never seen a reference to it in any of the historical sources, but I may just not have, have seen the right historical source. But that would be an interesting one to look at because the fact that they could delimit the townlands and the estates so very clearly perhaps that you know, there was somebody was charged with what the, the boundaries yep That's a good question <laughs> uh, uh, let's see this uh, question coming from Aidan O'Lynn uh, he says was the difference between the, the type of land use economies for the warrior sets and the sets that focused on administration past reliable differences in townlands so with the modern landscape, it's difficult. Um, I can see obviously where good land is and bad land is, and that is very much depend. You can tell that based on the townland size. So if it's per um, a per soil, you get the bigger townlands. So you get them towards the west, um, and that western border, and that's the Galglass and Felham O'Neill. So yes, you could say that. They were given the power land because their primary role was defence as opposed to providing for the Lord. The better land is in around the O'Donnellys. They get very good land. Um, it's smaller townlands, so you can tell that then it's better quality of land because it can support more in a smaller area. Um, in terms of that pastoral arable split, I'm not sure because there hasn't been enough um, paleological surveys done to look at that difference across Tyrone and that's don't get me wrong um Hall has done some really good research on that in terms of the wider landscape and the fact it was scrubby bush and there was pastoral economy with some arable mixed in but in terms of looking at each individual estate and how that estate um possibly was split between pastoral and arable I don't know and that's a gate escape more more possible research for the future um, but again it's having that strategy and that policy in place to actually look at these landscapes um, and do that kind of that kind of work to answer those questions um, but I think where the town lands are smaller and there is more administration the church lands for example they wouldn't have had to provide soldiers and work so they were farming so I would say those um, landscapes were probably more that arable pastoral focus, farming focus. I hope that answers sort of the question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, just, I think you, you did touch on it again about whether you think that the um, situation was similar really across Ireland or was Ulster was always just a little bit different? I'm not sure. Um, I think we always like to see ourselves a little bit different as an island and then each of our provinces. I think with, with West Ulster, there's so little, what's the word? Um, it remains very Gaelic, I hate to use the word now, but yeah, well. you know, there's not as much influence in terms of actual Anglo-Normans, for example, on the ground and then later on. Yeah. Um, so I think from that point of view, yes. And I think other areas in Ireland where there's that kind of separation, there may well be similar patterns. And again, that's why we need a all island strategy to look at that and say, you know, does my theory about the drumlands, can that work somewhere down south? Um, can it work in County Down where we don't have the Bodley maps for, but we have... We have the drumlands there. Can we can we apply it? We have the townlands, so can we apply the same process? Again, yeah, really interesting to see. You know, as I said, it was sort of basically um, you know very much a sort of rural um, economy. Um, were there any significant urban centres at that time? Okay. The urban centre, the most thing akin to an urban centre would probably have been Dunganham as the seat um, of O'Neill. That was where his tower house was um, and that's where his Cranog was. But I think it's our kind of modern look at things. 
they didn't need an urban site because they weren't it wasn't a market economy mm -hmm. and it was still very much resources were gathered to give to the O'Neill to pay fees and duties um, where they would have come together would have been at the likes of Tullahogue and the inauguration sites for fairs, for fates, for inaugurations, um, for those seasonal activities. And that's that would have been their, their marketplace. Um, so I don't think, I think some people look at it as, as lesser because there's no urban activity, but it worked for them. Yeah. You know, you didn't need it, no, exactly. Yeah. And they still, I mean, obviously the lords and the chieftains got their wine, they got their expensive clothes. So they were engaging perhaps in Dundalk, Dublin, um, Waterford and London. They were engaging in that more commerce um, activity, but they didn't bring it back with them. You know, they, they, they maintained those kind of very rural networks. They didn't really try to introduce that kind of urban and commercialised landscape, which is interesting because um, I think they just didn't need it. They decided this works for us. We can take what we need and <laughs> move on. Yeah. Right. Has anybody else got any questions you'd like to put to Laura? Anybody? Last chance? I got off lately. Yes, <laughs> relatively lately, but probably people will be thinking of, thinking of all sorts of things. Oh, I should have asked her that. So there's two on YouTube here that I'll just put in the chat. Thank you. Okay, uh, right. First of the ones on YouTube is, can we tell what a medieval raft would have included? Would there have been supporting structures outside the raft, such as buildings, etc.? I can't say conclusively, but probably. Um, there's activity that you would keep within the raft, so perhaps pens for the cattle, your house storage, um, activity outside might have included um, smithing, um, working with the crops. So, yep, absolutely. And that's, I think, not to be overly critical, because who am I to judge, but a lot of excavations and research in the past has perhaps focused on the wrath and what yes. was inside yes. it as opposed to looking at the complete environs um so that's that's definitely something that, that needs to be part of people's strategies when they're looking at doing excavations that it has to be. and same with tar houses you know they look at the tar house <laughs> they sort of forget that that the wider landscape yeah yeah um now, uh, there's Andrew Kane, who's uh, really interesting. That I'm working on a project with the Ulster Historical Foundation mapping the plantation estates across all nine counties. Can we compare notes? Yes, absolutely. Um, um, I, think I don't so know how, how best to get you my email, but yes, we can. I can do that. Yep. Well, if yep. Andrew wants, wants to get it in contact um, with the UAS, and we'll, we'll make sure that we get in contact with you. Yep. Yeah, so, pass my email on. Perfect. We'll do that, hopefully, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. More thank coming in. Right. Uh, anybody else then? Right, well, it just uh, remains just to say thank you again very much, Laura, for a very interesting <laughs> project that you've been working on. I think you've given us well, a lot to think about. And, <laughs> uh, you know, just to think that there's probably a a lot still hidden there that, as you say, is very ephemeral remains and your various research projects will probably hopefully unearth some of them in the future and you can come back and tell us yeah. about them. Yeah, it was a bit of a whirlwind, but, you know, thank you very much for having me and the puppy stayed quiet pretty much the whole time, <laughs> so you'll get a treat later. <laughs> well, en enjoy, enjoy your, your new pup, that's great. <laughs> so, uh, just reminds me and just to remind people about the, the lecture next month. Um, actually, it's a change of lecture. Uh, unfortunately, our speaker um, has uh, had to um, bail out for personal reasons at the moment. Hopefully, we'll get her back sometime next year. But um, Rory O'Boyle has kindly jumped in and will talk to us about the Vikings in Ireland. Um, but there's a change of date, so please, uh, if you could please note, it will be the 24th of October, not the 31st of October.
So for any other events and so on, can you just keep an eye out on your emails on Facebook and on the, the UAS website for up upcoming events. And hopefully uh, we'll see you on the 24th of October. And that one, I'm pleased to say, will be um, back in the lecture theatre at Queen's, but it will also be on Zoom. We're doing it as that sort of a, a hybrid. And uh, hopefully that will work well. And um, after that, in November, we've got um, our conference on the uh, 12th and 13th of uh, November, the evening of the 12th, and then all day on the 13th. Again, that will be live. Uh, at Queen's and also on Zoom. So I hope lots of you will be able to, to join us. Details will be on our website. Um, so please keep an eye out for that too. So thanks everybody for now. Thank you again, Laura. And we'll see you again next month. Thank you. Bye-bye.